Well, how much of hearing God is something that happens individually and how much of that happens together as a community? In this video, we're going to look at the pattern that we see laid out in the Bible and reference that to find the answer. That's coming up. Hey there guys, welcome back to the Multiplying Disciples channel. My name is Mark. It's great to be with you on a channel where we give you simple tips, simple tools, simple principles, and insights to help you multiply disciples, leaders, and churches until there is no place left that hasn't heard. And in this video, I'm going to continue a new series that I'm starting here on understanding spiritual gifts. Begin to talk about hearing God's voice as the foundation. We'll continue to talk about that in this video. I would encourage you to check out that last video to begin to understand this context for hearing God's voice. Now, as we dive in, I want to talk about the reality that uh, so much of us, for those of us in a Western context or a Western mindset, which has been exported all around the world, so so many of us have got some lens of a Western way of thinking in the way that we think about spiritual gifts in the Bible. It's just part of how we see it, and so we've got to be aware of that so that we can uh, make sure that we are getting back to what the original author's intent was or exegesis. And so when I say that Western lens, what I mean by that is we tend to read everything in the Bible as individual promises and God speaking to us individually, primarily, and not to uh, the collective or to uh, the people of Israel, for example. And most of the Bible is written to groups of people, God's people, uh, his body, and not to the individual. So we've got to get uh, to where we can address that lens and get honest about that. So to talk about hearing God part two here, I want to look at uh, a very familiar passage and then its implications from Acts chapter two. So Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit is poured out, right? And uh, I'll flip back to that, look at another passage here in a second. And uh, Peter stands up and he brings clarity to this chaos and he begins to point to uh, Joel 2 as the reference point for what is happening. And so uh, he begins to speak about the fact that, uh, th that this is the, the Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh. And um, he says in Acts 2.17, In the last days God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So, it, to provide understanding of what's happening, the Holy Spirit's coming and being poured out, and there's all these, these uh, seemingly hard to understand, uh, crazy things happening. People think they're drunk. What do they do with this? And uh, Peter points to Joel 2 and the fulfillment of God's promise that the Holy Spirit would not simply rest on prophets, priests, and kings, which we see all the way through the Old Testament, but instead on uh, everybody. It's, he's going to pour out his spirit on everybody. And so the, the, in the context here, 3,000 come to faith that day. And the promise is that they would be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit, beginning there in Acts 2, 36 and 37, that as they repent, as they believe that they're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, them, their children, and all who God would call. So this is significant because that means in this moment, the Holy Spirit is now no longer coming upon specific leaders for a short period of time, but is coming on and in every single believer and follower. Now, I want to fast forward here a couple of chapters and uh, talk about the implications of this. Because as you go to, to Acts chapter 6, we begin to see that the, as the disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained that the Hebraic Jews, um, their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So here's what happened. Here's how the church dealt with this. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Now, why would I bring up this specific passage after reading that Acts 2 passage? Well, Jesus entrusted this movement to the apostles and it's Peter standing up here. The apostle Peter is standing up and he's preaching. And it's the Apostle Peter here in Acts 6 as they're bringing this concern to the apostles about uh, the neglecting of the widows. So it, it would make sense for the apostles to say, here's what we're going to do. But instead, they turn to the community. Now, 
uh, in the Old, Te Old Testament context, these guys would be the ones that the Holy Spirit's come on. He's using them powerfully. But instead of that being the, the, a way of centralizing that power, Peter and the apostles stand up here and say, our job is not to answer this question for you. Our job is not to hear God for you in the old sort of uh, uh, blueprint of like a Moses. Our job is not to do that. Instead, choose seven men among yourselves. In other words, they're going to hear God and they're going to identify who God is using for this task. And so we see here a quick push early on in the church to giving away authority to the saints because the Holy Spirit rests in them and on them to discern what God's will is. So when it comes to hearing God's voice, it's very important that we not just talk about how the individual is rightly positioned, very important that they be positioned as sheep, see my previous video, and that they are equipped with the way in which God speaks, his character, the story that they're in, but the way in which we're discerning God's character and the story that we're in is not individual even. It's collectively that we are hearing God together. So when people come in and they say, God is telling me to do this big life changer. He's telling me to do this and this and this, unless the community that they are hopefully and biblically should be submitted to uh, discerns that that's God's will, then they really need to submit to the community until together they are saying, yes, this is God's will for your life. Now, an example of this in practice in the churches we find in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, the book of 1 Corinthians uh, is about a church that is in a messy place. The whole uh, context here is Paul is writing to this church, and very early on, it's he's talking about uh, confronting this idea of tribalism. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. I follow Christ. And he's like, is Christ divided? What are you doing? And uh, they're all over the place. And some of this comes down to the spiritual gifts and uh, the fact that there's these different gifts rising up. So he begins to talk about in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, which I'm not going to unpack in this video, but he begins to talk about the way in which spiritual gifts should be understood in the context of the church. And to, to the point that I want to make in this video today when it comes to hearing God's voice, and this is for you leaders out there as you're wanting to build a culture of hearing God's voice, we find in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul um, giving some instruction here. And in verse 26 to 33, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each one of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Now here's the key part. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And I think others here is not just implying just the prophets, but the others in the church here. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy, all prophesy, remember Joel 2.28, in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in the congregations of the Lord's people. Now, what's interesting here is Paul is coming into a messy church. Sound familiar? We're back to Acts 2 again. There's this crazy outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It feels like everything's all over the place. He's wanting to bring order to that. And what he points to is what orderly worship looks like. The Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Father, they're not separate. They're one. And so together, this community of Trinity uh, discerns and moves together. So too should the people of God. So he's giving this blueprint from heaven in the book of 1 Corinthians, and now the application here is a community that hears God's voice together, right? And so when you come together, each one come with something to share. Be prepared to give. And then uh, as pro prophecy is shared or uh, hearing God for other people is the way I would define that, um, that, let others test that. In other words, it's the group together that's going to discern if this is God and the Holy Spirit. Now, to put this together with the first video I made here, identifying the character of God rightly and the story that we're in, the Bible that we are living out today and continuing to add chapters to, uh, not add chapters to the, to the written word of God, but to, to, to be the living word, to be the letters uh, written on our hearts, as Paul talks about, to, to continue to live out that story is to discern that story together, not individually. It's not me coming along, being the Pope in my own life and saying, this is what the Bible says. It's together discerning what the Bible says and how that looks in practice. So all that to say, I would encourage you as you are beginning to 
work out and live out this idea of hearing God's voice, that this is not a, a solo sport. And to begin to hear God rightly doesn't mean that you've got to understand his character and understand the story, and then he's going to speak to you in dreams, he's going to speak to you in visions, and, uh, and you're just going to run off and God's going to direct you. Now, we have stories of that throughout history. Uh, those are not normative. The primary way that we see throughout Scripture and throughout the, the, the Bible, and even I'll point to an example, Paul, who we might point to as like, man, he had a road to Damascus experience. He heard God, and God redirected him. Well, God immediately connected him with the church, right? So he's immediately going in blind to get baptized and brought into the fold of the church and submit to God's people. So Hearing God should not and will not primarily happen just solo, but will happen in the context of community. And so as you're learning to hear God's voice, submitting to and finding a church, a, a believing community that is practicing hearing God together is critical. So hope that's helpful for you guys. We'll keep talking about this, this topic of prophecy and then on to other spiritual gifts uh, as the Lord leads in hopefully the weeks and maybe the months to come. But uh, I hope that's helpful for you today, and I will see you guys next time.